Hi, my name is Laser Berman, diplomatic correspondent at the Times of Israel. I'm excited to be here today in one of Jerusalem's many beautiful parks with Dr. Michael Oren, someone you followed as a diplomat, as an academic, and as an author. For me personally, I've known him as a friend and as a professor of Middle East history at Georgetown University. Hi, Michael. Hi, is there. Good to be with you. And it's beautiful here. It's gorgeous. It really is. It really yeah. is. We'll be discussing Michael's most recent novel, To All Who Call in Truth. And I believe this is your second work of fiction to come out of the coronavirus year. Yes, <laughs> there's a third one coming too. Wow. Very productive year. Yeah, you're yeah. making a, those of us who watch Netflix all year kind of. I watch bad. Netflix too, believe oh, wow. me. Oh, yeah. So I just alluded to the many different hats you've worn over your yeah. career. And the sense I get is that at your core, your, self, your main self identity is, is as a writer. Or Definitely. As an author. Can you um, speak about that, why that is your identity, and, and how that's been with you throughout your different stations in life? It's absolutely true, and, and chronologically it's true, because I started off as a writer. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I came home from school one day with this very strange feeling, and not the feeling you expect a 12-year-old boy to have. It, I had a poem to write, and I sat down and wrote this poem. It was called, Who Cries for the Soul of the Pigeon? Uh, you know, it was a depressing adolescent poem. But then every day I came home and wrote a poem. And uh, by the time I was 13, I had a collection of poems. I, oh. I tried to get them published. They got rejected. I went up to my room and cried for two days. And uh, little did I know, the first of many, many rejections. I never stopped writing. Um, I never stopped getting rejected, too. Boy, I got rejected. I got enough rejections to fill the Manhattan, like a, a file the size of the Manhattan phone book. If you're going to be, if you're going to, you're a painter. You go into the arts, you've got to get ready to get, you know, your eyeballs knocked out all the time, all the time. So, um, but in 2000, I published my first um, work of fiction. It's called Sand Devil. Mm -hmm. It is the best collection of novellas about the negative desert, set in the negative desert. It's the best because it's the only one. And, um, and it, I'm very close to these stories. I lived in the negative for, for years. Mm -hmm. um, and the next book was a book I actually wrote based on my father's World War II stories uh, called Reunion. I used to go to his reunions. And it's a bit of a mystery novel uh, set in the World War II reunions. Uh, unfortunately, the characters would be quite old now, but this was written you know, in, the, in the late 90s uh, when these gentlemen were in their 80s. Uh, so, and then uh, earlier this year, I published a collection of short stories called The Night Archer and other stories, 51 short stories, which are, each one is completely, completely different. Mm -hmm. you know, there are love stories and ghost stories and, um, mystery and murder stories and historical stories and war stories um, and tremendous fun this book tremendous fun and uh, I got I know it got a lot of people through corona and, uh, and then they come up to my you know this to to all who call in truth which is this journey back to a different world which looks just alarmingly familiar to this world <laughs> right and then I moved on to short stories, um, to film scripts. When I was 17, I, I, I got won a, a scholarship to, to make a movie out of a script that I wrote, and the movie ended up ma winning the Young Filmmakers uh, Festival of PBS. Wow. And with that, uh, I thought I, I'm obviously going to go to Hollywood, and uh, went to Hollywood, and uh, was Orson Welles' assistant, wow. which was horrific experience. He was a terrible human being. And if you wonder how I get along with all the prime ministers and the presidents, believe me, if you've been through, uh, if you've been through Orson Welles. Um, but I also um, grew up with this fascination slash obsession with the state of Israel and knew that I had to come here. So I left Hollywood, came here. I was a lone soldier like you. But I had also been to Israel many, many times before that working on kibbutz. Uh, so parallel to my, you know, my Israel involvement, uh, my studies in the Middle East, um, uh, lecturing, writing, ambassador slash politics, I've always been a writer. And um, the best compliment I always get for my history books was that they read like novels. And I'd say, oh, thank you. That is the nicest thing you can say. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes my novels read like history books. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's speak about this, uh, this book. Um, for our listeners who have yet to read To All the Call and Truth, how, what would you say this book is about, broadly? It's about betrayal. It's about passion. It's about obsession. It's about murder. It's about an everyman who's caught up in his time and caught up in, a, in an impossible situation mm -hmm. and trying to navigate just life. Um, 
it is, it is, he is a, Sandy Cooper, my, my hero, is, is a complex character who's not complex in the face of things because he's, he's a junior high school guidance counselor right. who's also a football coach. He occasionally coaches basketball and baseball. And, um, and he's, caught, he's caught in this world of 1972, which I have a lot to say about. We can get to it later. Um, and you see how it, a person who, in the, uh, on the face of things, is actually quite normal has to deal with very abnormal circumstances. Yeah, so, um, so you, you discussed the, the time it, it takes place. And I want to first talk about the location, because reading some of your other work and listening to you speak, this seems to me like you're describing the environment in which you grew up, where it's a working class suburb, Jews, Irish, and Italians. How did you create that world in which you grew up in, uh, the details, and, and why did you want to place this story within that world? Well, it is definitely the world I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a town that was for roughly half Jewish and half Italian and some Irish. Yeah. There were a couple of wasps there. We, we didn't quite know what to make of these kids. Like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we felt sorry for the wasps. And, uh, and I grew up on the sort of the wrong side of the tracks. I grew up in a working class neighborhood where I was the only Jewish kid and, and experienced anti-Semitism pretty much on a daily basis. Um, and I, I did play sports, and you know, as a Jew on a team where there were very, very few Jews, sometimes the, the only Jew on the team was very rough. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this world of 1972-71. And let me, a word about the world, okay, because that world has disappeared. It is a world which in many ways evokes the current situation. Uh, if you were to ask a, a young American back in the early 70s about the future of his or her country, he'd say there isn't any because there was uh, upheaval on campuses and there were bombs going off in federal buildings and there was the Watergate scandal and the future looked very, very bleak. And um, I think to certainly contemporary Americans that, that scenario will look very familiar. Mm -hmm. It was also a world on the cusp of the, of the civil rights movement and one of the edgier parts of this book are the relationship between whites and African-Americans, but also Jews and Afri African-Americans. Um, and it's edgy, particularly in view of, you know, of cancel cultures and people you can fall afoul of, but I, I had to write about that relationship. That relationship was very close to me and very close to my father, um, who dedicated his life to building bridges with the African-American community. We grew up on the outside, so outskirts of Newark. He worked in downtown Newark. Um, so it was important for me to, to, to delve there and, you know, whatever dangers there are. Um, it is also a very Jewish book. Much of the book takes place around a conservative synagogue. Yep. It is the last moment in American Jewish history where Jews were an ethnic group. Jews are no longer an ethnic group. Um, the great American Jewish writers I grew up on, Philip Roth, um, Bernard Malamud, um, uh, Saul Bellow, Saul Bellow, whose son is the editor of this book, Adam Bellow. Uh -huh. um, you could take their whole corpus of literature and summarize it in one question. And the question was, how can I, an American, also be a Jew? Because at some level, there was, a, there, was a, there was a disconnect there, a contradiction. You know, Saul Bellow opens up his, his famous book, uh, The Adventures of Augie March, with the sentence, you know, I'm an American Chicago born. Saul Bellow felt compelled to be sure, yeah. I mean, with John Updike, right? I'm an American Pennsylvania born, or John yeah. Cheever, I'm an American New England born. Now, mm -hmm. but Saul Bellow felt compelled that. Now that question, how I can be an American and a Jew at the same time, is not only not asked by Jews today, even young Jews, even Haredi Jews is not asked today. They don't even understand the question. Wow. They don't even understand that question. So that world, a very different world where Jews were an ethnic group. We had our Jewish jokes. We ate bagels. Nobody else did, yeah. right? There was no like which no bagels with everything on it. Significant, back then, right? Uh, no salt bagels. Story. No, just yeah, the, yeah. the Jewish food. Yes, yeah, sure. it was Jewish. There was real, real Jewish food that Jewish people ate, mm -hmm. and um, and I wanted to capture that moment because it's gone. Last point was that um, there were also towering figures of American Jewish life, and and they make cameo appearances in this book. Yes. Elie Wiesel, Shlomo Kalibach, and Mir Kahana. None of them by name. None of them by name, but anybody who's, I don't know, you're not, I'm a lot older than you, but you recognize them? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And if you have any knowledge of American Jewish history, you're gonna recognize the man yeah. with the wispy hair and the, and the faint voice talking about the Holocaust on a stage. Yeah. 
And that really happened to me. Mm -hmm. I was 15 years old. I went to the JCC and to, to hear Elie Wiesel. And the crazy thing is people didn't talk about the Holocaust back then. It was whispered behind doors. And I couldn't believe there was a man on the stage talking about the Holocaust. Yeah. I want to circle back to something you said about the Jewish-black relations in the conservative yeah. synagogue. There's this character, I think one of my favorite characters in the book, Lewis, the yeah. custodian, who I recognize in, in Jewish institutions I've been, this non-Jewish individual who's very respectful, um, often African-American. Often who, spiritual. Yep. Often a lot more spiritual than the people than inside the, the show. For sure. <laughs> he seems yeah. to exist only within the synagogue, because when the synagogue... Outside the synagogue, he, he somewhat doesn't exist anymore. He's somewhat of a prophetic figure. Yes. So can you speak about that figure and what you're trying to say about uh, black Jewish relations then or today? The character of Lewis is based on, a, on the custodian in my synagogue, a gentleman mm -hmm. named Gary. I don't think I ever learned his last name. He taught me how to play chess. Okay. You know, like yeah. the, the, <laughs> the right. queens, whatever. The janitor taught me how to play chess. He taught me to be respectful in the synagogue. He used to, when I ever walked in the sanctuary, with, sanctuary without a kippah, he put a, he slapped a kippah on my head. He he knew psalms. Um, he was a huge influence on my young life. And um, you know, I don't want no spoilers, but uh, he disappeared in kind of a cataclysm that occurred. And our, our biggest concern was whatever happened to Gary. And um, and to this day, I don't know what happened to Gary. He, he, for really? me, he's kind of I don't know kind of an Eliyahu type of figure. Yeah, that's the sense I got, that the, uh -huh. Lewis was a, a prophet who spoke truth and, and only existed within the context of the Senate. And then and it disappears, right? right? And, and uh, yeah, there was something vaguely redemptive and messianic about him. Yeah. Now, in addition, in addition to my journalism role, I'm also an artist, and it dawned on me this year, painting during Corona, that anything I produce is also, I'm saying something about myself, but in a costume. I think I recognize some of what you've said about yourself in some of these characters, split into different characters. The awkward teen who becomes an athlete, who uh, meets Yitzhak Rabin and, and shakes his hand. That's Maybe, me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, some of the other I stuck myself in there. For sure. And yeah, I yeah, think yeah, I recognize yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, this book has something uh, of a, a, a bleakness about it, has, has something seething below the surface. It's not a very optimistic book. Are you trying to say something about your past, about um, the world, or about the present? There's, 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 there's this energy, I think, which is, is different than in some of your past works. And it's also different than my next work. I have another work of fiction that's coming out next year, which is light and fun. Not this book. Not this book. It's yeah. very, very few Jews mm -hmm. <laughs> in the next book. It's a, it's a murder mystery set in, in New England in 1944 and uh, with a female, uh, a woman police captain. I'm asked to deal with a serial killer. Okay, okay. so that, that, that's a <laughs> completely <like> different <laughs> thing, and it, and it's, it, it is tremendous fun. I mean, it's, to read a serial killer can be fun. This is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, this book is not fun. This book is, is very serious. It's, it's dealing with serious issues about, about loyalty and faith and, um, and, 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 and the tremendous dilemmas of just being. And, um, and I, think, I think it was something I had to go through. Perhaps it, was, it reflects what I was going through in the corona period which was a very bleak period, especially someone who, whose life was the world, particularly the Jewish world, which all of a sudden collapsed. Um, and I'm um, reflecting on some of the relationships I've had in life that have been, you know, challenging and, and complex. Um, and I felt a need to reconcile, do shalom, with the world that produced me. Mm -hmm. And the more I grow distant from that world, the more I realized how formative and extraordinary that world was. Just what I said before about being Jewish, being an ethnicity. When I played sports, there was a, um, written on the bathroom stall in our locker room was the question, are Jews white? And under it, someone had scribbled, yes, but. Very relevant today. There's no yes, but anymore. It's like yes, emphatically. All right, <laughs> and but we were different back then, mm -hmm. and um, and America was different. America was a white bread country. You had to be a was to be an astronaut, yeah. and uh, and and we were profoundly aware of being different. Mm -hmm. And to what was going on in this period is we were beginning to celebrate our differences for the first time. When I was a little kid, and I used to leave show, my uncle used to take my kippa off my head. You don't want to wear that outside. By the early 70s, we were marching for Soviet Jewry right. and, and protesting at the White House. Yeah. And it was a, 
it was this sort of resplendent moment in American Jewish history where we could be Jews and proud Jews and proud, and Golda Meir was, you know, in the posters, and Moshe Dayan was in the posters, and Israel was good, and we were fighting the good fight against evil communism and, uh, and standing up for ourselves. Um, the Meir Kahana in this book is not the Meir Kahana we know from Israel, you know, the racist fascist. Oh, he's crazy in the book. Yep. But he's actually delivering a message that Jews are, 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 are resounding to, are, 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 are rising up. He's saying you've got to defend yourselves. You can't be passive in the face of anti-Semitism anymore. Now that is an increasingly relevant question today. How do we stand up to anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. Now one of the scenes or one of the lines in the book that really stopped me in my tracks was about anti-Semitism when there was anti-Semitic anti uh, graffiti at the school. And uh, the main character says, how could this happen? This is 1971. Now, 50 years later, it seems comical almost to say, oh, what, someone 50 years ago could think that, how could anti-Semitism happen? We know the future, in the, or the, the, the last 50 years, how that played out for Jews. It's interesting, because when I started writing the book and I started dealing with anti-Semitism, I thought, oh, no one's gonna, everyone's gonna say this couldn't happen, this couldn't happen. By the time the book was, was published, as you said, it's almost yeah. like, it's soft peddling anti-Semitism compared to what there is today. Right. Because there weren't people going into synagogues with automatic weapons back then. Yeah. So when you, when you reflect on where anti-Semitism has gone from your youth or the world that you're, that you're recreating to where it is today, w do you think that, there, that we were falsely hopeful that it was going to go away, that, that, that some people uh, really had their, their hopes in the wrong place? Do you think anti-Semitism has gotten worse, has, has moved from different communities? Manifoldly worse. And it has moved from, from different communities. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I experienced the whole smorgasbord of anti-Semitism. I grew up, I was a Christ killer. And then I worked construction and I was, um, I was soft and rich. And then I was in the sports teams and I was, you know, um, I was Ill, not really man for being Jewish. Uh, then I was in Israel, and I was a child killer, <laughs> and I, I, every different type of anti-Semitism I experienced. But that anti-Semitism was usually confined to certain segments of America. It has now morphed into Saturday Night Live and the night, nighttime talk shows uh, and become increasingly acceptable. And American Jews are at a deep and profound loss of how to deal with it. And one of the deepest problems they face is how to define it, because we had a very specific definition of anti-Semitism growing up, and we were growing up in the shadow of the Holocaust. Today, you see these different groups of American Jews, American Jewish scholars trying to come up with definitions of anti-Semitism. It's very difficult to fight against something you don't, can't find right. adequately. Mm -hmm. So when you know, Saturday Night Live makes a joke about the Jewish state only giving vaccinations to Jews and not to Arabs, which is, it, which is a libel in the true blood sense of the word, the blood libel. It's patently anti-Semitic. You know, part of the American Jewish community says, well, that's not anti-Semitic, it's legitimate criticism of Israel, even though it's a lie. Um, that, is, that, is, that, to me, is, is the source of, um, I think, pervasive uh, confusion and pain for American Jews. Now, many of the people that today are you know, on Saturday Night Live or these shows, they would say that they're um, the most open, the most tolerant of people. How did anti-Semitism reach those, those individuals in those communities? Why is it coming from, from those places? Then? I think it was always there with Leighton, and it's mm -hmm. subliminal. And I think that Israel has given sort of license to those subliminal dark um, you know, instincts that they have, those impulses, that they've always been there. And um, <laughs> I was home for Thanksgiving, home meeting in the United States, my parents. My father was actually dying at the time. And uh, there was a discussion around the Thanksgiving table. This was the last, it was right after the American elections. And um, of course, within 30 seconds of sitting at the table, it was about Trump. <laughs> and, uh, and being an Israeli, of course, immediately everyone assumes that I was pro-Trump. And, um, and my family, young members of my family, were blaming me, get this, for anti-Semitism in America. Why? We've got to follow this logic. Okay. Uh, because Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital was obviously the work of Jewish power in the media and the banking. And that actually um, conformed to what anti semitic it affirmed what anti Semites say about Jewish power in America. So by recognizing Jerusalem, the recognition of Jerusalem actually contributed to anti Semitism, whereas my nephew said at the time, it endangered my life.
Wow. Trump's recognition of Jerusalem. He's a very sane guy. He's a wonderful guy, my nephew. But Trump's recognition of, of Jerusalem endangered me as an American Jew. And at which point the funniest, not funniest thing happened because my father has a caregiver who we all adore uh, from, uh, from Eastern Europe. And she came over to the table and while she was serving the turkey said, well, of course, you know, he's right because as everyone knows, the Jews control the media and control the banks. <laughs> this is my, my anti-Semitic Thanksgiving. Yeah. Then, it got, then the same nephew had had a, uh, a person at work say something anti-Semitic to him on the phone, not directed at him, but against, not knowing he was Jewish, but against their boss. Okay. And the question was whether he should report him, his colleague, and get him fired. And as an Israeli, of course, I was adamant that he should immediately report him and get him fired. And uh, everyone in the family was against me. Because by doing that, you'd only make him more of an anti-Semite. Are you following? You, you, you're laughing because you know all these arguments. Right. Um, and um, it, we, we were not resolved about these things. Um, I said to, I said to uh, my nephew, I said, well, you know, if he had said something against African Americans, if he had said something against Asians or, or Hispanic Americans, would you have reported him? He said, yes. He says, why are you giving me a pass on, on anti-Semitism? Because mm -hmm. those people have suffered a lot in, in, in recent years. I said, well, having a third of your people knocked off in concentration camps, that's not suffering? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. <laughs> so how, do, how does Israel, how do Israelis... You know, it's like a little, like a, a one-act play out of this Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, um, how, how do Israelis <laughs> speak to, to American Jews? I assume many, of, many American Jews w would think like this and would make these arguments. It, it, we, we are increasingly lacking a common language. Um, when I was insisting that, that my nephew report his colleague for anti-Semitism and get him fired, um, I, I think people looked at me like I was a radical, that I was a, you know, a man with a, with a gun. <laughs> wow. And it, it, it's these, these, what's coming to the surface are very deep divisions between us and American Jews. Um, one of them that, that always touched me deeply as an ambassador, but also just as an Israeli citizen, was the difference between Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Memorial, yep. and the messages they're in, and the conclusions that they leave you with. Mm -hmm. Because um, the Holocaust occurs according to the Holocaust Memorial because of hatred and intolerance, and the solution is education, right? And openness and love. Uh, according to the Yad Vashem here in Jerusalem, the Holocaust happens because the Jews are weak and they don't have an army. Right. And the answer is Stahl, is the IDF. <laughs> yep. And that speaks to me very much. Uh, to me, you want to get educated, get educated. But if you come at me as a Jew, I'm going to be the guy with the gun. I'd like to turn the conversation to issues on our mind in Israel and in the Jewish world in general. Now, you were ambassador during a Democratic administration under President Obama. Joe Biden was vice president. And there were tensions. There was fighting in Gaza at the time. We're back under a Democratic administration in the United States. Joe Biden is now president. And we have fought once again in Gaza. And there's tensions that have come to the surface. Do you think the tensions uh, have changed? And do you think the nature of the relationship has changed significantly since you were ambassador? But the same issues, different tensions. Okay. Well, let me start off by saying I, I know Joe Biden very well. He was, in many ways, my point of contact in the administration because, unbeknownst to many people, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, boycotted the Israeli embassy for most of my term. Mm -hmm. um, it was part of the administration's attempt to take down the U.S. as a relationship a couple of notches. But Joe Biden wouldn't go along with that. And he loves Israel. He's deeply attached to Israel. That I know. Mm -hmm. The people around him, whether it be Secretary of State Blinken, National Security Advisor Sullivan, are of the same mind. I know this. Um, but they are a democratic administration. And the Democratic Party and administrations have policies that are at variance with our policies on many levels. Joe Biden, obviously, is not Donald Trump, but he's also not, he's not Barack Obama. And he's not deeply driven by ideology but by policy. And that is why the tensions are different. The tensions with Obama were up front, out there, um, intense and, uh, and relentless. Relentless. Mm. It was one crisis, even. it was revolving crisis at yeah. any given day. day. And right, sometimes white hair. it seemed uh, <laughs> gratuitous at times too. They sought conflict. Yeah. They sought conflict, make it public. 
right. again, to change the nature of the relationship. They taught mm -hmm. to change the nature of the relationship. To a large degree, they succeeded to change the nature of the relationship. They, they, I mean, we used to say that, that it, support for Israel was a bipartisan issue. It, it, you're hard to make that case today. So do you think that we've, or Israel has lost the Democratic Party and it's going to become increasingly... I think we lost parts party. of the Democratic Party. No question. Not the party, not the center of the party. And then uh, we haven't lost the Joe Bidens. Mm -hmm. But then Joe Biden also belongs to a certain generation. That's the, that's I remember the, the Six-Day War, the 73 War, Israel right. in their heart. Um, we have a problem with younger Democrats, much, a much bigger problem. So, um, so different nature of tensions, but the issues remain the same. So this administration, like the Obama administration, is deeply committed to the two-state solution based on uh, the 1967 borders with mutually agreed swaps, um, fulfillment of Palestinian aspirations for a capital here in Jerusalem. Um, and that, you know, find, has found expression immediately in the, in the administration. There's nothing that the Biden administration has done that has surprised me. I, I'm not a prophet, but I predicted every one of them. I predicted they would reopen the consulate here in East Jerusalem, yeah. that they would renew support for UNRWA, mm -hmm. uh, that they would reopen the Palestinian embassy in Washington, that they would go back to, you know, the Obama-Clinton parameters. All that's happened very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, but they've also resolved not to make our differences public the way Obama did the Obama put put uh, was up. it was about daylight and no daylight. Yeah. Uh, Obama was all about daylight, and what they what this administration did, I think, very cleverly, very smartly during the recent Gaza crisis, was to keep all the criticism quiet, just to come out every day and say we support Israel's right to defend itself. But when they demanded a ceasefire, that made it very very difficult to say no. Yeah. If think about how Obama would have handled this, he would have come out on the first day and said I want a ceasefire. I want this. This 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 is you know this is the. This is unconscionable that Palestinians are getting killed. In 2014, it took weeks to find that ceasefire. It, because, because of the contras, they say in Hebrew. Yeah. Because it created a situation where the, the prime minister couldn't be seen as giving in to the president of the United States. But here, the president of the United States had been on our side. Yeah. So Netanyahu was very hard pressed to come out and say, I, I reject what you're saying, after, after uh, Biden very smartly had, had come out and defended our right to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Very good, a, a class A piece of diplomacy, I thought, really. I give the high, as a former professor of history, I give a <laughs> high A plus. Oh. A plus, but yep. what's the but? The but is Iran. And this administration remains deeply committed to renewing the JCPOA, the 2015 Iran nuclear deal which Israel and I see not only as a strategic threat, but as a potential um, existential threat. And I will say unequivocally, Laser, that if that JCPOA is renewed, it will lead to regional war. And whoever renews it will have a great amount of blood on their hands. That's a very radical thing for me to say. I believe it with all my heart. Mm -hmm. And yep. why they want to renew it, I don't know whether it's domestic politics, um, or they actually believe it's going to you know, stop Iran from getting a bomb. It's going to do just the opposite. And um, I mean, I think I understand American policy. Well, I think I understand why. Um, I don't think America really has military options anymore. I, don't, I can't see a situation today in the world anywhere where the United States is going to project major military power mm -hmm. under almost any circumstance. Now, it seems from the latest round of fighting and also around the Iran issue that Israel's message is hitting home less and less in the United States. Because now. any message is because it's no longer about the deal itself. It's about if you're pro-deal, you're pro-Obama and Biden. If you're mm -hmm. anti-deal, you're Trump. So there's not a Hasbara problem that Israel has or the, the specific spokesmen that are making their message think that no so matter who my, makes the My message. dear friend Yosef Lai and Levy and I wrote an article for the Atlantic Monthly uh, mm -hmm. about Iran's position on the, on the, about Israel's position on the Iran nuclear deal. Because one of the great advantages that the framers of the JCPOA had was that the deal is so technically complex that nobody can understand it. So we decided, we sat down to unpack it. Okay. It takes me a couple days to write an article. It takes Yossi a couple days to write it all. This article took us five weeks. Just because of the complexity of it the is, issues. It's taking the complexity and making it simple, making yep. it accessible to any reader. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think we did it. And then we tried to disseminate this article to uh, pro-Israel Democrats. And we got nowhere. Really? Mm -hmm. This is with the, the most accessible article about the Iran nuclear deal you could make. Because yeah. it's no longer about what's in the deal. And, but that's true of so many things. We're sort of living in a post-factual world. And our Hasbara, our public diplomacy, has always been based on facts. And our facts are going up against feelings. And that's like shooting a ping pong ball at a tank. You know, no one cares about the facts anymore. 
do you think Hasbro can succeed in that world? I think it, I think it's its chances of succeed, a success will be challenged, mm -hmm. but it can't use the old formulas. Right. So we went into this latest round with Gaza, and you know, I, I interviewed you know throughout the period on all the major networks, international and uh, European, American, um, and I was supplied with messages, messerim, that were the same messages we've been losing since 2006. For sure. Shop worn. No one listens to them anymore. Yeah. No one listens. It's a double war crime. They're firing behind civilians at our civilians. You know, yep. what does that mean, double war crime? Nobody understands it. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, they got John Oliver calling us war criminals. So what are we responding to that? So we're not thinking out of the box. We, we were stuck. We're stuck like 15 years ago in our public support. So in, in order to have a, 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 you know, an inkling of a chance, we're going to have to uh, really rethink the way we explain ourselves to the world. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the first question. But post-factual? I can't, I think on every single interview I did in the Gaza campaign, they had a number, 236 Palestinians killed. Now, no one was saying, you know, in relative terms, that's less than three other wars we've had, okay, where many hundreds, if not thousands, were killed, but it, okay. But of the 236, about 180 were terrorists. Yep. Of the 236, 20 were killed by Hamas rockets. <laughs> So in, in some of these interviews, I had to stop and say, listen, I see what's written under my name. Let me explain to you something about that number. Yeah. But everybody had that number. Mm -hmm. and that's you'll never see it broken down. Yeah. And I said, you know, this is like the police go and break up a bank robbery. And they kill five bank robbers, and they inadvertently kill two of the hostages who were caught in the crossfire. But the headline the next day is cops kill seven people in a bank. That's the equivalent to doing yeah. that. Sure. And... Um, but the fact that I even had to stop every interview and do that, which I don't like doing, I don't like, I'm, I'm not there to take down their arguments, I'm there to make mine, yep. um, is I don't like being on the defensive in any way, I like being on the offense. Yep. So um, that was disconcerting. So we're, we're gonna, if we're gonna have any chance at all, we're gonna have to rethink the way we explain ourselves. Mm -hmm. My final question is, what's next for you? Um, what's next for me? A, a lot of things. Well, first of all, you know, I'm. I'm in the business world, it's another hat we don't talk about. Okay. I'm in the high-tech world, and I'm about to leave the United States to do a lot of high-tech things. Um, I have uh, another novel coming out, and I have, it's called Fourth Cliff, and um, that's the one about the 1944 policewoman serial killer, yep. uh, few Jews. And, um, but the biggest hat I'm wearing is a, is a, is a NGO, a non-government organization that I've established called Israel 2048. And um, I don't know how much time we have. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. This is an initiative that I began in the Prime Minister's office. I was the Deputy Minister to Netanyahu uh, in Knesset. And I, one day I went to Netanyahu. I said, let's talk about what Israel should look like at its 100th birthday. Got very excited. He says, all right, we'll make a state commission. Badal mm -hmm. Very difficult to establish a state commission. We'll see how hard it is to do on the Moron disaster right yeah. now, right? Very difficult. I did. I went through all the legal, you know, uh, calisthenics to do this. And, um, and in the end, uh, Bibi wouldn't sign off on it. Really? For a very simple reason. He was afraid of his findings. Because wow. <laughs> <laughs> he it, it, it was going to have to look into, what do we mean when we say we're the nation, say the Jewish people? Yeah. What, is, what, what are we going to do about the Haredim? What are we going to do about the Arabs, the Israeli Arabs? Um, and I wasn't going to shy away from anything. So when he refused to sign on it, I went to my good friend, Nathan Sharansky. I said, let's take elements of this and do it ourselves. So we had a, a study group discussion group in the Hartman Institute for a year, um, particularly on, on, on Israel diaspora issues. And then Corona came. And during Corona, I used Corona to write the Israel 2048 vision as a manifesto. And a number of wonderful people have taken the manifesto and created an NGO around it. And the idea is to use the manifesto as sort of a, a starting point for a national discussion. And we just had four rounds of elections without a single issue being discussed other than the future of the prime minister. No question. For a country such as ours, yep. okay, in view of what's happened the last few weeks in our cities, that is just inexcusable. Mm -hmm. And young Israelis want to discuss. They want to talk about the, 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 the state that they will inherit, that their kids and grandchildren um, will inherit from them. And the idea of this NGO is to create the framework for the national discussion. I call it a national tish. <laughs> and, um, which we're just not having here. People are desperate to talk, and I think I want to give them that framework. So uh, that's where I'm going off now to also to uh, fundraise, to promote. 
Uh, we had a major article in Hadassah magazine this month. Um, we've done all through all through Corona. We did Zoom talks on various aspects of Israel 2048. Last week we did one on on issues of sovereignty. Why the Maron disaster was exactly the same disaster as the uh, inner city fighting in Lod and Ramlin, and uh, it's a breakdown of sovereignty. Um, so all of that I'm doing, and I'm still uh, involved in politics in sort of quiet ways, and involved in uh, trying to build bridges with this uh, with this administration, because uh, I again I worked with all these people, and I will also be passing through Washington uh, on this trip uh, for that purpose. Best of luck to you. Thank and you. Thank you, Michael.